a session. And so indulge me for a second. Uh, so our next presenter is uh, Mumu Xu. Uh, she's an assistant professor with affiliations in aerospace engineering at the Institute for Systems Research. Um, and she is going to be presenting on her work, um, uh, Certification of Autonomous Vehicles, a regulator oriented approach. And so with that Mumu, uh, you should be able to share your screen. Okay, let me see if that works. Nope, I don't wanna do that. Here we go. Hi, everyone. Um, I hope you're having a, a great day so far and thanks for sticking around um, to sort of almost the very end. Um, I'm gonna be talking today about certification of autonomous vehicles. Um, uh, it's sort of in the, the subtitle is the regular later oriented approach. And the idea here is a little bit different from um, my usual talks in that there are no equations in here whatsoever, which gives me a little bit of heart palpitations, um, but uh, all for the better, right? Um, so some of this work uh, will will really talk about um, the autonomous vehicles as in general and the, the idea behind certification of them. Uh, Matt Scasser, who is talking next, um, will probably be able to rebut and refute and clarify a lot of the things that I'm talking about now um, or add to. Um, but anyway, so that's just sort of preface to it. Um, so, so one of the fundamental challenges about regulating autonomy really is that we don't have any good idea about how to translate what we do now, which is regulating people, to what we eventually need to do, which is regulating systems. So right now, most, if not all systems that rely on um, uh, sort of rely on humans for autonomous reactions, and they do so by testing a person's knowledge or their judgment. So think about um, your driver's license um, tests or uh, licenses to become a pilot. Um, but we don't really know how to measure the knowledge or judgment of a system. And that's kind of where the one of the bottlenecks is in sort of um, moving forward in these types of systems and certification. And so we either need to really understand how to do that or figure out an alternative approach to sort of proxy judge or human judgment. Um, so either way, there's sort of work to be done in this particular area. So in this research, which is fairly recent, um, uh, we sort of focus on a naval aviation system um, because that's where um, the, my P former PhD student, um, Commander Costello, um, he is sort of a commander of the US Navy. And so he is familiar with these types of systems. And so we're we're focusing on these as a um, uh, as an example, um, but it, by no means would this be something that sort of stays only within um, naval systems or within military um, systems, but the idea would be to that this could be generalizable to, um, to sort of our civilian world. Okay, all that preface on the title slide, I promise I won't go over our time, but we're going to continue on. All right, so Currently, when a naval aviation system or probably any system is cleared for use, it's assumed that a human will be in the loop and is responsible for its eventual use. So, um, you know, think of your Tesla autopilots where the car might it might uh, drive itself, but really a human pilot has to sort of, or human driver has to be in the driver's seat or should be in the driver's seat at all times. Um, we really do have humans in the loop, even if they're not physically present in the system itself. Um, but the, the current sort of certification for, um, for uh, someone to be a driver or a pilot or anything is really a, a trust process. So if you are trusted by someone higher up to be trustworthy or reliable or safe in driving or flying, then we trust you to sort of operate that, that vehicle. Um, so really what we're trying to do now is think of a process for, for flight clearance. Um, and these systems are software intensive, as you know, because... Uh, you know, more and more of these systems rely on complex software um, uh, for all sorts of things that they do. So again, the sort of current way of thinking of things of, of how we certify is that there's certification of a system and the system is certified um, via technical area experts, either through their own expertise of from experience or from, you know, data sets or anything like that. Um, and then there's certification of the pilot or the driver. Um, this comes from flight experience, from sort of exams, from trust from the commanding officer. And so these two things are the things that we want to sort of figure out how to reconcile um, as we sort of move uh, forward and develop a path toward um, certification for all autonomous systems in general. Okay, so the use of UAVs, um, we sort of all know, um, or have been sort of um, aware of these types of systems more and more. Um, they're increasing certainly within the DOD. Um, so Triton and Fire Scout are just two examples of them. These, um, again, may appear to be autonomous, but they're actually really um, full of 
automation as opposed to autonomy. Their behavior is sort of deterministic in nature and you, there's always a pilot or a remote operator that's ultimately responsible for the operation of that craft. So why do we want to think about autonomy? Um, so a lot of the expense of operating systems comes from training crew crew members or its crew to sort of use the systems um, and constant upkeep of training new crews. So if that training aspect can be removed, um, the cost savings uh, in theory would far outweigh the extra expense of certifying a new system. Um, or so the, sort of the thinking is. So this is again, similar to self-driving cars. They are certified for operation, but not for autonomous operation because ultimately someone is responsible for that operation of the vehicle. So again, automation is prevalent within naval aviation right now, but autonomy is the future. And autonomy, you know, there's no human in the loop anymore. The aircraft is able to sort of make decisions on its own depending on what happens in the environment. Um, so the, this research really came about um, starting in the fall of 2017. Um, my student was actually um, sort of looking for a topic for research and then um, was sort of uh, working at the same time and um, was involved in something called the ACUS program. So the Autonomous Aerial Cargo Utility System Program, which I'll explain a little bit later, um, and sort of was looking at this program during its final design review and final demo. And then from this particular system, um, he was asked to kind of determine a path forward to certify the autonomous systems um, as sort of demonstrated within a naval, naval aviation system. Okay, so a little bit of background, and this is a little bit of me being lazy in that these um, references are part of a manuscript or journal article that you can reference here. But um, all this to kind of say there's been sort of several proposed approaches for certification of unmanned or autonomous systems. Most of these approaches deal with small UAVs or with theoretical models for large vehicles. Um, so current safety of flight certification is designed to be, um, so uh, to sort of approve a system to be used by a fully qualified pilot um, against theirs. So, so that's kind of the difference here. So within, um, Within the, the modeling and simulation community, there's a number of, of techniques that, that people have used. Within the formal methods community, which is sort of where I belong, um, there are a lot of methods to determine the safety critical nature of software itself. Um, there's work in runtime verification, model checking, fear improving. Um, there's even work that deals with limitations of simulating a pilot situational awareness. All of this work is limited in scope, um, not that it's bad um, in that it's limited in scope, but it doesn't quite address the, the need for an entire approved methodology. So, you know, when I'm looking at um, the, the software side of an autonomous system, I'm really looking at, you know, the, the, the avionics or um, um, the high level controllers or, or some, some subset of the software, but not the entire system as a whole and the entire methodology to get that system approved for flight. Um, so that's really what we're doing here. Um, most of this work also doesn't really consult with aviation certification officials. Um, there is an exception. The formal methods group at NASA Langley has done some work in that regard. So they are working in, in looking at um, attain obtaining flight clearances for U.S. within the national airspace. Um, their work um, really focuses on, on objective standards. So things like how do you uh, making sure that you the aircraft maintains a thousand foot separation, um, but not so much the judgment tasks, which are things like interpreting environments and making a best decision. And those things are really, really difficult to kind of um, to tackle and really think about as well, even though those are the things that are um, probably the, the ones that will get us you know, past that goal line. So what we're trying to do, um, so NAVAIR, which stands for Naval Air Systems Command, um, was sort of uh, given the task of certifying all naval, so they're given the task of certifying all naval aviation systems that are safe for flight. Um, Matt can sort of uh, correct me if I'm wrong in any of the stuff um, as we're going along anyway. Um, so again, the process uh, itself is um, a risk mitigation process and it assumes that the system will be used by a qualified pilot or a, a air vehicle operator. Um, and again, we want to try to think about a new process here. And so this methodology really, really tackles that. And because it's a it's a beast of a problem, um, we're actually going to narrow it down and think about a confined area landing slash landing zone mission um, as an example for this research. So, um, uh, so sort of uh, structuring it so that we're really tackling a particular um, uh, example or small example of a mission and not an entire uh, mission or thinking about all the things that can happen within um, the system itself. 
Okay, so these are really the steps um, in this proposed methodology. And um, this is work that's available um, uh, in the Journal of Aerospace Information Systems that was recently published. So the steps involve first the requirements definition, um, a definition of the flight envelope. Um, steps three and four I highlighted because it's a, a formal methods approach in, in, in terms of um, uh, taking a look at the requirements and developing a protocol or control laws. So this is kind of where um, the, the, I say the really wonky theoretical technical work um, that I am uh, sort of comfortable with um, sort of lies steps three and four. And then the rest of it um, would be the things that we actually need to think about besides, um, uh, besides steps three and four. So we think about formal methods approach, we think about developing control laws, and then we go into modeling and simulation, um, the design process for flight tests and execution of flight tests, and then a full report of those con tests um, conducted on the specifications that we originally defined. So this would be the methodology here. Um, so, so within the requirements, um, there is currently a, a checklist that's performed by, um, uh, by helicraft, um, aircraft commanders to complete this particular mission. Um, and it, it's uh, abbreviated by sweep. So really the things that, um, they take a look at are size and slopes so of size of the landing zone, um, the slope of the landing zone, the, um, uh, amount of wind that's um, sort of prevalent uh, at the time. Wind is something that we don't really take into account into this in this particular work, um, but uh, but it is uh, it is very important. Um, elevation, escape route, and then the amount of power that is left or is required um, to land. So landing in an unprepared landing zone is a, a, a fairly difficult mission for for qualified pilots um in the last 15 years there's actually been several fatal mishaps where they had to make decisions that lead led to unsuccessful landing attempts and therefore the the these sets of sweep requirements were sort of as, um established in a way to kind of um uh, create a checklist to avoid these types of scenarios and stuff. So we're taking these um, these requirements and, and using that as the basis for our um, uh, methodology or the beginning of it. So those requirements are sort of uh, converted into um, a specification um, through the form of a state machine. So this state machine specification satisfies sweep. Um, and it starts from, from an initial state here. I won't go through all the different steps, um, but you can sort of read about it in the in the paper itself. We go through um, from an initial state, we conduct these sweep checks. Um, if at any time any of these checks come out um, uh, uh, false or negative, then we can sort of loop back into our initial state. Um, and so we sort of go through and um, determine whether or not uh, it's safe to land and then go and actually land in them. And so these are sort of all the different um, requirements um, that have been established um, in our discussions with uh, technical experts as well. Um, once that happens, we then go into the formal methods activities. And this is kind of where I claim that we can do a little bit of a plug and play in, in the sense that there are numerous different types of techniques available uh, from uh, formal methods, again, there's model checking, there's runtime verification, there's theorem proving. All of these things um, are sort of different tools depending on the system and the, the, the method, depending on the system and the mission that we're taking a look at to then go and um, uh, specify that these things are correct and, and, and determine if, whether or not they are safe. So within this particular example, we do a very, very high level um, analysis of the of these simple specifications um, and analyze them for consistency and completeness um, and whether or not they will satisfy the requirements. We go and do this. Um, we um, use a theorem improving model in this ex particular example to help define um, the environment and the top level specific, uh, top level assumptions. Um, so you can sort of see all these propositions really are in the form of, of booleans, um, but these can get as complicated um, as your model uh, could uh, needs. Um, and then we go and run this on a theorem proving tool called PVS um, to kind of see whether or not these um, uh, these requirements are satisfied. Um, and then from there, we develop a protocol. So this is a, a hand-developed protocol. Um, eventually, we'd like to be able to kind of automate that development of the protocol. Um, so this translates the, the sort of propositions into eight different assessments that are evaluated against all possible combinations, and then to verify that whether or not um, uh, the, a potential landing zone is a valid landing zone. So this 
uh, is seems like if you sort of go through the steps and I sort of rush through it quickly, but it seems like a very trivial step in the sense that, oh, that makes sense. Um, uh, but this would actually be considered an artifact for certifying autonomous behavior. So if we go through and show that these simple steps um, are a way forward for, for trust in a system, um, I think that goes fairly far in, in getting to the point where we can get a flight clearance um, for these um, aircraft or subsystems. Okay, so that's sort of the first step. We go through and develop a protocol. We go through and, and determine whether or not these um, our, our model and our system will, will satisfy those requirements. And then the next step is to get into the, the notion of flight tests. Um, I actually haven't been tracking time. How much time do I have? Okay, I'll just keep going <laughs> until someone stops me. Um, all right, so, so once that happens, we sort of think about flight tests for an autonomous system. And so here um, really is thinking about um, uh, uh, what the, uh, about the, the sets of requirements that a system needs to satisfy in order for, for someone just to say, okay, you are safe enough to fly or safe enough to approve for, for autonomous flight. Um, so we sort of developed um, flight test matrices to complete this particular mission. And then we analyze a developmental test and an operational test um, uh, on uh, this particular system called ACUS. And so this is the, the helicopter that um, uh, was used for these series of uh, demonstrations. And so, um, so ACUS was an ONR funded technology demonstration program um, that uh, Aurora Flight Sciences was sort of the, the prime um, uh, uh, contractor on. Um, and they used um, Talos, which uh, is a decision engine on board uh, the, uh, the helicopter. So it takes inputs from the sensors and then it goes and makes decisions on it. So this um, helicopter was outfitted with Talos and it flew under an FAA experimental certificate, which meant that it required a safety pilot on board. Um, so here it was sort of meant to, to kind of use, it used sweep to define the, the envelope or the box of um, uh, a flight that it was allowed to do. Again, not all of the sweep components were programmed into it. Um, and they went and um, tried to, to or, or completed a, a resupply mission for um, uh, an overall resupply mission, in which case the, the landing zone mission is the subset that we're actually taking a look at here. Okay, so um, the, the, so in the developmental test portion, this the uh, helicopter was basically um, uh, tested to see whether or not it could land in an unprepared landing zone, um, and uh, it, it was held at um, at Quantico. Um, and uh, between December 2017 and 2018, there were about six sort of flight um, tests that were done, or six events that were done um, at the time. So here on the right, you can sort of see an, a, a visual of. The, um, the sensors uh, visualizing the landing zone as the helicopter is sort of getting going in for a landing. And so you can see the elevation is um, decreasing as we go along. So everything in sort of the blue, sorry, the tealish cyan part is where um, either the area is safe for landing and there's no object seen or um, there's not enough data to determine if there's any anything in there um, in size. But you can see that your situational awareness increases at the lower you go, which makes sense. Okay, so of 33 landings, there were a few deficiencies that were not um, uh, terrible. Uh, I should say, let me just show you this video here. So in this video, um, a golf cart is driven uh, into the middle of this landing zone. And uh, what you will witness is that the helicopter is able to spot it. So Talos was actually able to spot it um, and abort the landing. I don't know if I would have volunteered to drive that golf court ever um, in this situation. So uh, a brave man to do that. <laughs> um, so the deficiencies were, were fairly minor in the sense that um, there was one, there was an instance in which there was a landing spot that, that the safety pilot had determined was actually much better um, to, to land in. It was actually closer to some of the, the big wigs. Um, so it would have been made a much more impressive landing if they'd chosen that one. But um, you know the system itself didn't actually continuously assess different landing zone spots. Once it found one, it continued on with that. That just requires some you know reprogramming. Um, some of the the aircraft modeling dynamics didn't quite match the the performance itself, and so those are things that needed to be tweaked. But overall, um, it did fairly well. Uh, overall, it did fairly well, and it was sort of able to progress to the next set of operational tests. So. 
So DT is really the show that the flight, the aircraft can do exactly what you want it to do. OT is a little bit different in that it's kind of, um, here is the overall mission, now see if you can perform it um, well. So this was done in April, May of 2018 in 29 Palms out in California. So um, so here uh, is an example of um, what the the, the Talos um, sensors had, had seen. So it had some issues with landing zones and that these are tumbleweed shrubs. Um, and the pilots from their judgment were able to select a landing spot and say that you're able to land. the. Talos decided that it wasn't able to land, though, however, and sort of gave up. Um, and so there was sort of a mismatch there in between um, uh, the, the different, um, uh, the pilot versus the computer. Um, so of those different um, landings, there were 46 landings. Um, the the, the green one is the test that showed the first sort of successful resupply mission. The, the ones in red were issues where there was foliage or that, or there were sandbags that were on the ground that the, the sensors picked up and said it couldn't actually land where in, in fact um, the pilots actually deemed it uh, able to land um, itself. So from those flight test results, um, they, the aircraft was able to complete the mission under controlled conditions. It was not able to complete the mission when it encountered issues that were not pre-programmed or that required a pilot's judgment to complete. Um, it determined that some of the issues were actually due to vehicle situational awareness. I won't get into the details of that. That's sort of a, a future, um, a, a different um, set of work. Um, but some of it was, uh, it was due to vehicle situational awareness. Okay, to summarize, um, this is uh, an overall proposed methodology to think about certification for autonomous vehicles. So most of the work that you've probably seen kind of broaches this formal methods approach development of protocol and control laws, and really thinks about um, the software systems and the technical work um, of modeling um, your system and development of those protocols. Um, the, the work here is kind of trying to broaden that to kind of show where that would fit within the scope of a full methodology to get from system to full certification. Um, so that's where this lies. Um, and I wanted to thank everyone for their time and I'm happy to answer any questions. I haven't checked the chat. Um, so let's see what's going on. Thank you so much Mumu, uh, for the presentation. Again, I'll do my sad little clapping here um, <laughs> in, in lieu of the, uh, of the attendees. Um, so again, if, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to go to the Q&A uh, feature and, and post a question. Um, I, I do have a brief question uh, regarding um, some of the previous presenters, right? That there's certainly been a shift in the community to think about learning-based controllers uh, for, for you know, autonomous systems. Um, and and I, I guess we wanted to see what your view would, would be on uh, the certification process for, for this type of controllers. Yeah, that's actually, um, and you are not a plant because we did not discuss this. Um, uh, we're actually holding a, a virtual AI certification summit in on June, I think nine and 10 or 10 or 11, that really talks about this. So we're bringing in folks from, you know, NASA, FAA, uh, Navy, um, uh, to, to really talk about what they would need in order to be comfortable with certifying systems that incorporate AI components or learning enabled components. And so really no one has a good answer for that. Um, you know, I don't know if I would trust, you know, it's, it's a problem of it's, it, these systems are, are black boxes and they're very brittle. Um, so no one has a good answer. I can, I will possibly be able to better answer you on June 12th. So, so yeah. That's great. We'll, we'll, we'll follow, we'll follow up then. Um, um, thank you, Momo, again. We, we do have some questions if you have time to go into the chat box and then. Uh, yeah, I can type in those answers. Great.